Uh, okay. Uh, we need to improve data collection. I think the questioner is absolutely right. There are a number of national initiatives going on just now to do that. There is a programme under the title Improving Evidence and Data, which is between Scottish Government, local government and health colleagues trying to get better available local data quicker so that we can have a better understanding of what's impacting on what. Uh, there is work going on again between Scottish Government, the Improvement Service, Solace and others to develop a framework for benchmarking between community planning partnerships. So a very small number of outcome indicators would characterise that framework to look at variation and diversity across the community planning partnerships of Scotland on those core indicators. What that's throwing up is we've got some things that are currently just bad measurements and not helpful, and we're going to have to get rid of those. Uh, there's other areas where we have no measurements at all. I think it is odd, given the focus on outcomes in Scotland, that the first reliable, comparable measure we've probably got of how kids are doing in education is at the age of 16, which seems, given the amount of investment we're presently making in early years, utterly puzzling that we should wait to 16 to discover uh, whether that's paying off or it isn't paying off. There's local measurements being made at earlier stages across Scotland, but they ain't standardised, and therefore we couldn't bring them to you and say, well, you can now make comparisons across Scotland, they've got a single Scottish figure different. So there's a bit here... It's about deciding how much standardisation do we want and how much should this be a very locally driven thing where people use whatever measure suits them locally as long as it's driving their practice locally. So just to reassure you, there is a lot of work going on just now uh, and we'll happily copy you into details on that work uh, as a committee if that would be helpful to you. Uh, on improving the measurement base and the database we've got at the present moment and also speeding up the flow of data, which is often quite slow by the time you get it back to local level. As, as you can imagine, we, we love data in Audit Scotland, and um, it's, it's enormously important. And there's loads of it. I think this isn't a question of there isn't enough data. It's about the nature of that data and, what we're, and import, most importantly, what we're doing with it. And I think to, to make the connection with your point, Mr McMahon, about the, the political end, end of this as well, is that the, the data can be quite challenging. And I think there's something about... Um, how data is used to then select priorities and indeed in the selection of priorities what we're deprioritizing some of the examples that that colin gave earlier on about the kind of spending decisions that need to be made very often if you're using data about the community and about community need and about where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck may not always be what politically or indeed in the community people think is the best the best thing to do. So it is really, it can be very challenging and that's why it's really important that it's robust, that it's used well and that people take care in how it's presented. I think I think sometimes the, 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 some of the examples you gave earlier about things not happening is because I think people haven't taken enough care in how that's presented and how the argument is put forward. I think um, we need to be more mindful of, um, and I include ourselves in this, more mindful of the context in which the kind of data and the analysis is, is landing, if you like. So, um, so you're pushing at an open door with us. I think the more more and better use of data, and as Colin says, there's loads of stuff happening, and we're very supportive of all those things. Yeah, good. Can I maybe uh, add a couple of things to that? I, I think um, so for a very supportive of uh, the idea and application of benchmarking, and uh, you know, the important thing about benchmarking is it's not an end in itself. Uh, its role is really to drive service change. Uh, in effect, otherwise, why would you do it? Um, in doing that, the one thing that we tend to think is that consistency is very important. And uh, if I give an example here, uh, if we're looking at the integration of uh, adult health and social care uh, in a submission, uh, SIPFR actually advocated that uh, there should be a national uh, performance management framework set up for data, which is client-based, so not focused around about how the service is being provided, but more on the outcomes for the clients or, or outputs for the clients in, in many respects, so that regardless of how it was done, you can actually compare consistently between the different uh, ways of doing things and maybe actually try and establish which ones work best for which reasons. This, this, this might be a, a question more directly to you, Mr McKinley, but I'd be interested to see if anyone else can go with an idea, if anyone can. When evidence has been produced or which a decision is being justified, you can at least measure that, you can make a judgment on whether that evidence leads to the conclusion that the people think it has. 
But when people counter that, how can we ensure that the arguments in the other direction are evidence-based? You know, for example, recently uh, I've been very frustrated at a, a service, a health board uh, decision in, in my local area was overturned, um, having been given the task of providing a service or, or designing a service. They produced a report, but it was overturned without any evidence uh, to counter the, the outcome that the, the health board had produced. So how do we get ourselves into a situation where evidence is being produced, outcomes are being set, the inputs in, uh, are being measured, but the decision has been overturned without any evidence going in the other direction? How do we prevent that situation from happening? Um, so I'm probably going to try and neatly sidestep the specifics um, of that example, Mr. Superman, if that if that's okay. But the point the point you raise is an important one, and I think um, I suppose for me we we we've talked a wee bit today about the political context in which all of this operates, and I don't I don't think there's any point in kind of fighting against that. I think that is the world in which we live, and indeed local government and national government and in, and in parliament politics is what makes the world go round, and I think we need to find a way of working. With that, and and I guess it's it, very often, and again, this is one of the, the the tensions that we cite in our community planning report. People people are making decisions and judgments from slightly different viewpoints and perspectives. So a council is uh, is designed, and elected members are there to do the best for their local area. That will not always be the best necessarily for the health board in that area, which won't necessarily be the best for the NHS as a whole. And so it goes on. It's exactly the same challenge now exists in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and Police Scotland and other places. There are real tensions now in that local, regional, um, and by local I could go right down to kind of ward neighbourhood street level. There are always discussions and negotiations and tensions inherent in this process about what what the what the best answer is for a particular place and people will come at that. So I think in terms of the evidence bit, people can have a very strong case that this is the best thing for my neighbourhood. I live in Haddington. This might be the best thing for Haddington. It might not be the best thing for Musselburgh or Dunbar or anywhere else in East Lothian. And, and that's that's the kind of tension I think that I, I don't unfortunately have the answer to that. I don't think there is a silver bullet. I think that's why some of the stuff that Colin talked about in terms of relationships and trust are hugely important about understanding where your priority focus is. Um, if Taking the community planning example, if the community planning partnership is focused on inequality, where are the, the most problematic uh, pockets of that inequality and what are we collectively doing about it? So it comes back to me about um, the, that clear sense of priority in the first place and then everything else follows from that. Uh, I mean, it, would, it would be odd for me to come to Parliament uh, to defend politicians. You can do it for yourselves. But um, in a way, I think, in the absence of this just being left to the market, in which case I'll make my decisions about my preferences and choices I wish to make, if we're going to do it collectively in a democracy... Um, we elect people, and those people then appoint people to health boards and other such devices to make collective decisions on our behalf. Part of making a decision is unquestionably as their evidence for it and so on. Another part may be, no, we as a community just don't like this, in exactly the same way as I don't buy things I don't like the taste of, not because I have a rational case for not doing so, I just don't like it, so I'm not doing it. Um, and I think, I mean, the most spectacular example I can think of was probably the CARE report back in 2006 7, where an entirely rational analysis, evidence based and so on, was given at the Scottish Health Service. It said we should take out quite a number of A&E units, reconfigure hospitals, etc. It was utterly hated uh, by a lot of the public, significant number of clinicians who were affected by the changes being proposed. Um, and in essence, it was probably done in by people marching down the street saying, hands off our a &E unit, uh, is the honest truth. So now you can say that's utterly irrational, but these services are for the public on behalf of the public. And if they simply don't like something, that's part of what I suspect we have to, to factor in. So I'm not sure. I think politicians actually have a very important role here to reflect public opinion, some of which will not be entirely rational but is about values, feelings about the local area, uh, historical sensitivities, etc. But that's part and parcel of how we make decisions in our private life. It would be profoundly unlikely it will not be part and parcel. So as long as the politicians are well engaged with the communities they serve, and I think that's the critical thing, then some of that 
uh, non-rational, non-evidence-based stuff is important. I think the second point I make is very often one of our difficulties, and I think Fraser was really alluding to it, is much we, we have a lot of policy-led evidence. Because we've done something, we've got evidence about it. Uh, we often don't end up with evidence-led policy. We just have policy-led evidence. And that's almost inevitable, I think, in the mature system of, of, of public services. And the challenge bit that Gareth talked about earlier on never means important, that there are oppositions at every level of the system who will challenge whether that evidence is good enough, whether that interpretation of evidence is reasonable, uh, and so on. So I think evidence itself really resolves anything unless there's active people doing things with it as part of a scrutiny process, a challenge process, etc. Uh, can I just add briefly? Um, one aspect to this, which maybe cuts slightly across or, or causes difficulties for, for the role of CPPs generally, is uh, that um, in responding to the Independent Commission on Local Democracy, uh, we did suggest that one of the things to consider is defining what locality means for any individual service. Uh, you know, you probably wouldn't try and think about uh, designing a trunk road network for Scotland and thinking, right, okay, at a locality level, we'll think about five square, uh, f five kilometre blocks of that. And I think that there's maybe an issue about being clear when you're talking about services, what sort of scale you, you're meaning by locality and, and what area you're actually trying to service with that. And I think that's where, you know, the challenge might come in about, you know, it's like, is it the like local town level? Is it a regional level? That, that sort of thing. So I think the locality for the service, what, that lo what locality means for each service might be different. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, Gavin, to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you, Convener. Um, just two brief issues. The first one um, is from the Audit Scotland paper. Uh, it has been mentioned already, but the statement was made in that paper we should map the pathway uh, connecting a portfolio contribution to the national outcomes. So on first blush, a statement with which I would wholeheartedly agree. But just in listening to sort of evidence over the course of the morning, um, I just wonder how achievable and how useful such an exercise might be, particularly when you say that something like housing, for example, touches on everything. So would you just end up with a diagram of housing going to all 50 national indicators saying it... it if I, I just wonder, you know, while agreeing with that statement initially, how useful would that exercise actually turn out to be? I think that's a very fair question. It's, um, it's, as you say, it's one of those things that's probably easy to say and, and much more difficult to do. And to continue with the housing example, I think you would need to do it in a way that, that avoided exactly that. There's, clearly, you can end up with a very complicated spider diagram with everything connecting to everything else. And in a sense, that's that's always going to be the case. I think what you need to do is identify the, the kind of predominant links. Where is it going to make the biggest, the biggest change, the biggest difference? I think, uh, I'm sure Gareth will have a view on this, but I guess my view on, on things, whether we're talking about outcome-based or performance-based or zero-based budgeting and stuff, it's not an exact science. And I think we can get a wee bit sucked into thinking of it as an exact science. I think what it is is trying to shift ourselves along the road a bit from an incremental approach to budgeting and and, uh, and uh, you know figuring out what we spent last year and we'll take 3% off it to, a clo to getting better, getting closer to trying to link what we're trying to achieve overall with the resources we are using. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be, um, you know, th that point that, that Gareth made earlier about the kind of causality thing. We're never going to get there, and nor should we try. I think you would just tie yourself in knots. But I think it's worth having a go. And there is some interesting work. Uh, the committee may well be aware of it. Um, the Royal Botanic Gardens of Edinburgh, believe it or not, have been doing quite a lot. The Director of Corporate Services there has been doing a lot of thinking uh, with Edinburgh University and others about exactly how how you would go about doing that. Now, in a sense, they're looking at it from the organisational perspective, which is probably a bit more straightforward, because it's about that organisation's contribution and doing that pathway map all the way up. Um, but in terms of a methodology and approach, it's, it, it looks quite interesting. And the second issue, again, an uh, um, uh, issue was touched on. Modern apprenticeships came up earlier, just an ex as an example of the sort of outcomes we might look for. And I think the, the view of Audit Scotland there was that we were focusing heavily on existing performance measures, but there were no or little focus there was little focus on long term outcomes. Um, can you just expand on that? And if you know, imagine it was purely your role alone to decide what uh, measures there ought to be there. You're the, the cabinet secretary and the director of 
uh, in charge of it, and it's entirely up to you. Can you just give us, uh, without being exhaustive, just some of the examples of the sort of measures you would mean and that ought to be in there if we're, if we're going to tr treat that seriously? I can't possibly imagine what it would be like to be such um, uh, such lofty positions. But, uh, I mean, I suppose the challenge on that one that we, that we gave back to the government was... As I said earlier on, the twenty-five thousand number is a number, but what that what difference is that going to make? So, if the overall ambition uh, for modern apprenticeships is, and I'm not going to get the exact wording here because I can't remember the detail, but if it's to, you know, um, contribute meaningfully to the to sustainable economic growth, how does how is having twenty-five thousand as opposed to twenty thousand or fifteen thousand? How is it going to do that? And so, the measure you need to try and devise is not. Or, or indeed not instead of, but as well as an input measure, which I, I have no difficulty with, is it what is the net result and effect of doing those? And, and, and that's really important, Mr Brown, because I think what, what that then leads you to is getting into much more qualitative measures about the nature of those apprenticeships. So what does a good apprenticeship look like? What's the outcome of, of a good apprenticeship? Where does it end up? To what extent, once they've done an apprenticeship, do these uh, young people in the main uh, stay in employment and progress through employment for 5, 10, 15 years into the future. So I think if you start from the other end, it actually begins to ask some more challenging questions, not just about the number, important as that is, but then actually what what is it about those apprenticeships that's really going to make the difference? Therefore, what activity do we need to put in place to support those? What's our methodology for that? And actually, what's the... Um, what's the measure in the end? So I'm, I'm, I can't, off the top of my head, think of the exact measures, but in terms of a process, I think that's how I would describe it. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, Malcolm? Well, I think we're past our time, so I'll try and uh, roll it up into one question. Um, I mean, I think it's been a really interesting session. I, I've really uh, got a lot out of it. And um, I suppose my question really is about, I mean, about the national performance framework at a national level because everyone praises it and yet I did take in particular the improvement service paper and I think most of the comments of Colin Mayer to be quite a radical critique of it. Oh, that's certainly the way I read the paper and the way I've read some of some of his comments. So I suppose my question really is what do you think we need to do with it? Because in a, in a, in a sense you've almost redefined outcomes and said, you know, one part of your paper you, you're saying perhaps sometimes what we're calling outcomes are really objectives and I take it that you mean we need to have a more focused uh, attention to perhaps a smaller number of outcomes. So, I mean, perhaps you can clarify whether that is the case. And I suppose the related question, since I said I was going to roll it up into one question, is to what extent, if we do need to um, revise the national performance framework and have it far more focused on a smaller number of uh, um, outcomes that are really about improving people's lives and to my mind and probably to your mind, particularly the lives of those in our society who are more disadvantaged, to what extent do we have to drive that through into community planning partnerships and local authorities? Because there's always a tension between you know, localism and national objectives, which we're all committed to. So uh, that's me trying to roll my thoughts into one question. Uh, if I respond, I mean, I didn't write the paper as a radical critique of the national performance framework, so if it's come across that way, uh, that is an interpretation of it. I, I think the point I wanted to make in it really is that we have a framework there which is useful, I think it's shifted culture on, I think it gets people to focus out, so I think all these are good things. But if the national level wishes to make a contribution to change, and I would imagine you would, uh, then the question is, what are your ambitions and expectations? One of the challenges to community planning partnerships is if they put down, and this comes through, I think, the Audit Scotland working community, the number of measures that have no targets associated with them. So we want to make the place healthier, but we can't really say what by when. Well, if that's a legitimate challenge at the local level, then it would seem to be also a legitimate challenge to parliamentarians as well. What is your ambition and your expectation of the public services you govern uh, in Scotland uh, as to how we go forward? So I would welcome us focusing down probably in a tighter number. I think almost the strategic objectives of the National Performance Framework are where I would start. The people get wealthier, healthier, fairer, smarter, greener. Right, fine. What flows out of that then in terms of priorities you would have across a period uh, of time? Uh, 
And how do those priorities you would have at that level sit with the various priorities you will politically have about inputs, outputs, service standards, etc. Because all of that needs reconciled. Now that's what we're asking the local level, the community planning partnership level to do, and we're sometimes being quite critical if we don't think they're doing it. Well, ditto for Parliament then. Uh, that you would have to have a view about key outcomes you want to see achieved, time scales, targets that you're willing to commit to and be accountable for. Um, and then how does that fit? pupil-teacher ratios, never being able to close a primary school, whatever. Uh, and how do you balance off these different commitments you want to make politically in that way? So uh, I, I am sympathetic. I think the fairer cuts across everything else. It's not a separate set of outcomes. It is uh, we need to be greener in a fair way, that people should enjoy qualities of environments consistently across Scotland and so on. We need to be wealthier in a fairer way in Scotland than we are at the present moment and so on. So, um, so I'm sympathetic to the idea that inequality would be at the heart of this. I think the second thing I say is that even if we forgot all about the national performance framework in this discussion, it has spawned a whole lot of things that are ongoing. So there's big bits of work going on on educational attainment gap in Scotland. Why is it happening? How do we combat it? It's not explicitly referred to the National Performance Framework, but it unquestionably flows out of an outcome focus. There's a huge amount of work being done in health inequalities in Scotland as well. So, in a sense, I think, the framework has actually driven quite a lot. A lot of that continues on an ongoing basis uh, and will no doubt be reported back to various committees in Parliament in due course. So suppose just these two points, I think we could be more dynamic. I think the national should make a contribution by saying, well, here's our expectations at least, and we are willing to be judged accountable by our expectations for the system. Uh, and I think the second bit is to be aware that a whole lot of stuff that's not formally speaking within the national performance framework has been driven by the National Performance Framework. Okay. Well, uh, that has exhausted the questions from members of the committee. I have a few further questions, but I shall impose a self-denying ordinance given the, <laughs> the time that has elapsed since the beginning of the session. We have relief from the bill team behind you there as well. Uh, I see. Um, just wa want to uh, say one other thing, and that's just if any of the uh, witnesses uh, have any further points which have not been covered that they may want to touch on, just to finish off. I mean, it's very briefly, I think it was touched on, but I, I emphasise it more happily copy the committee into this if they're interested. We're doing a bit of work just now looking at how councils and the community planning partners use their economic capacity, their capacity as employers, their capacity as procurers, and their capacity as asset holders. And we're doing quite a lot of measurement around that with a group of councils just now and then rolling it out to see, is that a resource we're underusing to achieve outcomes? Uh, could we use these capacities much more forcibly to achieve the outcomes we see are priorities for our areas. Uh, that bit of work is ongoing across the next year, but the pilot stage would come to an end in about a couple of months' time. So if there is an interest, we would welcome your interest in this work anyway, and we're very happy to, to send it into you at that point in time. But I do think that economic bit is one we should not neglect. Public services are big economic entities. They should be partially judged by their economic impacts as big economic entities. Yes, given the interest in the committee on, on, on some of the things that you've actually raised, Colm, would be interested in that. Hey, Gareth? Uh, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, just to let you know that, uh, in a similar way to what Colm was saying, uh, CIPRA are actually planning to work with a charity partner on developing a practical structure for an outcomes approach and an outcomes budgeting, uh, and also for the assessment of preventative um, interventions. Uh, we too would uh, welcome being uh, uh, having the opportunity to keep you updated on that. I would just close by uh, coming back to what, what I uh, started with, really, which is, uh, from CIFA's point of view, uh, an outcomes focus is all a part of good governance. And uh, I would really sum up uh, what the international framework says. Uh, and if you don't want to read the whole document, which possibly you don't, I could sum it up in one sentence, which is, act in the public interest at all times. And I think if people have that focus and organisations have that focus, that takes a long way towards where we want to be, I suspect. Thank you, convener, and thank you again for the opportunity to um, give evidence to you today. I think one of the striking things for me about this session that, that is indicative of this whole debate is, is how much agreement there is. Colin and I were saying in the break there that we need to find something to disagree about um, in this session today. Uh, but 
but being less flippant about it, I, it seems to me that people absolutely sign up to the analysis of what the issues are and what needs to be done. And I think uh, I absolutely welcome the enormous amount of work that's going on to try and make it happen uh, and happen more quickly. And I think that's really the, the key for us now. It's actually about putting the infrastructure and the processes and the systems and the people and everything else in place to really take it to the next stage. For our part, um, and you know, given that your continuing interest will be around the budget uh, and the scrutiny of the budget, we will continue to push and challenge and support um, the Scottish Government, uh, indeed any Scottish Government in the future, to do more to link outcomes with budget and spend, uh, and if there's anything else we can do to support the committee in that, we are delighted to do so. Thank you very much for that, and I'd like to thank all our witnesses um, for answering the questions so comprehensively today, uh, and for your time. It's been a very fascinating session. I'd also like to thank colleagues for their uh, uh, questions. Um, now, uh, in order for our witnesses to be changed over, uh, I'm going to have a five-minute uh, recess.
Oh, fix. Oh, okay, fix him. Uh, we're still waiting on Gavin, but I think we've had a, a reasonable uh, recess, uh, given the fact that time has been against us uh, this morning. So uh, I'd like to apologise to the Bill team for keeping me uh, waiting so long. I'm sorry the previous session overran. I think the technical glitch uh, didn't actually help. Um, so our second item of business today is to take evidence from the Scottish Government Bill team on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill's financial memorandum. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting Callum Webster, Helen Carter and Anne McVie. And members have uh, copies of their written evidence received, so we'll move uh, straight to questions from the committee. And as always happens in this uh, committee, I'll start with uh, uh, some opening questions and then we'll open the session out to colleagues uh, round the table. And um, first of all, I just want to go on to um, paragraph uh, 24 of the financial memorandum, which looks at the uh, spend by local authorities between April and December um, 2014 being 18 million and the full year spend being estimated to be in the region of 29 million pounds. Now clearly that's not the full allocation. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are many discrepancies across Scotland in terms of how the money uh, has been spent. In other words, uh, some being uh, significantly underspent, uh, others um, hitting at the top of their allocation. And what's going to happen to the, the estimated four million pounds uh, surplus? I think there, there's been an element of variation between local authorities in their, in their level of spend. I think there were maybe three or four last year that actually provided some extra funding to the welfare funds because they they'd used up their, their allocation. There are, again, there were some other areas that were, that were below the level. And I think a lot of that was to do with the, the relatively slow start that the the welfare fund had in the first three months of operation last year. I think subsequent to the, the sort of first three months, the spend picked up to the level that we would have anticipated. And certainly even this year, our informal figures show that the, the spend is more or less in line with a, a sort of flat profile across at Scotland level. There's still some variation beneath that, but Local authorities are spending what we'd expect to spend across Scotland by and large. I think it's fair to say, and that includes the underspend from last year, which was carried over into this year for local authorities to spend. OK, now, um, there has been a significant concern, though, from a number of local authorities in terms of submissions that we've received with regard to the administration uh, uh, um, funding. Um, I mean, for example, Fife are saying basically that only about half the amount of money that they require has actually been allocated to them, for example. Uh, how is the actual uh, administrative funding um, uh, made up? Because not, I think it's... Um, North Lanarkshire, and we've got two colleagues around the table who represent uh, in North Lanarkshire, they said that they get 9.73% of the national share of applications, but received only 8.96% of the budget allocation, whereas Glasgow get about 15.5% of applications in the first four months of 2014, yet received 23.4% of the national budget. So how, how, is it, um, how is the funding distributed in administrative terms and indeed in terms of the amount of money that's actually made available to, to uh, provide the, uh, the funds themselves for, for, for the claimants? Um, going kind of back to the, the point about distribution, kind of in line with normal practice, the basis of the distribution of the funds across local authorities would, was agreed between uh, within the, settlement, the joint COSLA and Scottish Government Settlement and Distribution Group. And um, with that group, we discussed um, when the Scottish Government um, became responsible for, for local welfare provision um, and, and ministers decided that the funding being transferred from DWP to the Scottish Government should be spent for broadly the same purpose. We started discussing through that group what the, what the basis of that distribution across local authorities might be. And we agreed that the um, admin, bund admin funding should be based on... Um, the historical pattern of applications to, by local authority level under the old DWP scheme based on the most recent data that we had available. And that for the programme funding, that would be based on the spend by lo at local authority area under the previous DWP scheme, because that was the kind of best proxy that we had at that time to kind of assess the need and demand for the new arrangements. And that was kind of uh, 2012 figures, but given the fact that you obviously have, uh, you know, 
more up-to-date figures uh, in terms of um, how, how these funds are actually being uh, spent at this time. Is there any um, plans to re... I know that the budget you intend to continue to fix at £33 million a year. Uh, is there any plans to reallocate some of that budget um, across local authorities, given the difference in demand at, at present? Um, we went back to the settlement and, dist uh, settlement and distribution group in June um, with a view to whether we should change the basis of the allocations for 15-16. The original agreement would be to, to stick with the first distribution basis of distribution for two years so that we could take time to assess what was actually happening on the ground. Um, and um, last two months ago, three months ago, um, we, the, the agreement was that we should carry forward that original basis of distribution for a further year. Because at the moment we only have formal stats for the first year of the operation of the scheme in Scotland, and that was felt that that was too soon to take a view as to how how we might um, uh, reallocate funding within local authority or across local authorities at the moment. Um, but that was predicated on the basis that for the next time we discuss it, we will look at what's actually happening on the ground in local authorities and try and identify um, appropriate indicators to assess need and demand by local authority area. I mean, my own area, North Ayrshire Council, uh, their submission, they've said that, and I quote, the Council projects that for 2014-15, the total number of applications received will be around 12,954, compared to 6,445 in 1314, which is a doubling, obviously. Uh, based on current projections, the Council anticipates spending almost a million pounds more in the current financial year when compared with last year. Um, uh, and, they've, and they've said, uh, they've added, of course, a review of the current criteria required to manage spend within available resources. I mean, how can the, the, the funds that are currently being allocated possibly meet the demand given mm. uh, without a significant reduction in the type of application which, which is accepted? And of course, if, if the prioritisation changes so that only a higher priority cases then are awarded grants, surely then we'll end up with more people going to review because they'll obviously know people who the previous year got a grant, etc., etc. How do we actually try and square that, that circle? I think that's a very good question and it is quite hard to kind of square that circle. I mean, the, the, the way that the fund I mean, it is a discretionary scheme, it's not an entitlement-based scheme. And, you know, the, the guidance is written to give local authorities the scope to change the priority levels. Um, and it is a harsh fact that in sometimes, at some points of the year, um, and in some local authorities, there might be a, the ability to, to meet medium to low level priority applications, whereas it might be high in some others. Um, and that's something that obviously um, um, we'll need to keep under review, or ministers will want to keep under review as the pattern of demand for the, um, for the new funds um, well, becomes clearer. Uh, now, the issue of review, I think a number of colleagues will want to explore, so I'm not going to go into it in any great detail, but and, and there has been some concern, and North Eastern Council, of course, have raised this uh, in their submission, as indeed others have, about the SPSO um, hearing second-tier reviews, and they've talked about the fact that uh, if there's an estimated review caseload of 400 with a running cost of quarter million pounds, that's a unit cost of £625, which is more than the average cost of a community care grant in Scotland, which is £613. Uh, and doesn't demonstrate value for money um, compared to the service being provided by Scottish councils. What, what, what would your comments be on that? I think the first the first point to make is that I, I think we certainly expect, and Cosler shares this view as well, that we expect the numbers of reviews to rise um, quite significantly from the levels that they, they were at, certainly in the first year of operation of of the funds. There's also, I guess, the, the characteristics of the second tier review that we were we were looking for when we issued the consultation on, on review last year and and it was it was felt that SPO SPSO sorry met the desirable characteristics and were able to deliver them better than, than some of the alternative options, particularly I think the the requirement for being independent of the decision. That was quite a big factor that was considered um, when considering who would be best placed to, to deliver reviews. There's, there's also the, the issue of, of estimated costs as well, and we published a business regulatory impact assessment to support the bill, and that looked into estimated costs of second tier reviews within the Ombudsman 
as a tribunal and within a local government panel. And even though the, the costings that you were quoting from local authorities here seem quite high per case, our estimates in the BRIA suggested that the Ombudsman would actually be the lowest cost per case based on 2,000 cases a year. So there's a, I guess there's a variety of, of issues around that. I mean, obviously there's an issue about secondary reviews being carried out by the existing local authority, but I suppose they could always do, a local authority could handle its neighbours' reviews and vice versa, perhaps. That might be a more cost-effective uh, way of doing it. But surely uh, um, you, if, if the overall fund doesn't increase, but awareness rises and, and prioritisation changes, as, as we mentioned earlier on, you're going to get more going to review, and we're going to end up with a higher proportion being spent on reviews than actually being delivered. I don't mean the bulk by any manner of means, but we're going to end up with more money going into administration, surely, than actually delivery at the sharp end, ultimately. I think from the figures that we published in the brief, I think that would be an issue, regardless of of the second tier review route that, that was taken under the bill. Because the figures, as I said, the figures for tribunals and, and a local government panel were, were higher than the Ombudsman. I accept that they look in relation to the to the the grants that are being paid out, the costs do look high, but I think in order to give people that opportunity to have a a proper independent second look at the, the case then but, I mean, in some local authorities, more than half of all the reviews are actually being awarded to the applicant. So, clearly, there is there not an issue that some local authorities are perhaps not actually delivering what they should be delivering in terms of awards? I think some of the, the high turnover rates probably attributable to the fact that it's a new type of service for local authorities to be delivering. It's, like Anne mentioned, it's a discretionary scheme. It's not an entitlement-based uh -huh. scheme. So, I think there's... Across local authorities, I think there's been a, a period of time where they've had to, to feel their way into how, how to make these types of decisions and, and how to take into account vulnerabilities of clients and, and special requirements that they might have. And I think we are working to try and ensure there's consistency of decision making across local authorities and that the guidance is being applied consistently, notwithstanding the discretion that local authorities have within the guidance on decision making but I think a lot of the the overturn rates are quite possibly related to the fact that it is a new scheme, it's a new way of working for local authorities that we are trying to help them get to grips with. Um Switch that off when it was already on. In terms of the funding, though, why has it been was it decided to have fixed budgets given the fact that in the first year there's bound to be less people aware of it? and the demand is bound to increase with time, surely. What is the thinking behind having £33 million a year for three years rather than having a, a steady increase in the, in the fund as demand increases to allow a situation whereby local authorities don't have to continue to tighten um, the, the criteria uh, uh, as funding diminishes? I think min ministers took the view and you know, it's, it's, it's part of the, the, the budget process and it will be you know, reassessed every year or reappraised re every year um, when the budget document gets printed, presented to Parliament. Um, it was a bit of a kind of unknown. I mean, in the financial memorandum, we set out how much was being spent by the, under the old DWP arrangements, um, and ministers took the decision to, to increase the amount of money that was transferred from DWP to the Scottish Government and, and then onward to local authorities. Um, and, you know, came to the view that £33 million would um, broadly restore what had been spent historically in, in, in Scotland under the old DWP scheme, and that to give a degree of stability, that that would be maintained for the first three years of the scheme. I mean, whether that, you know, that's something that will be, be discussed and um, uh, challenged through the, the, the budget process um, going forward. Yes, I know Minister's put an extra £9.2 million in a year, actually, to try and provide that kind of cushion, but now it seems that the cushion is... Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're up against it. Just one last question, because obviously I want, I want to tell our colleagues in, and that's regarding the... Uh, the computer system in terms of IT costs, um, and it says, uh, um, Argyll and Butte Council notes that following introduction of the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund, each local authority has had to make its own arrangements for computer systems, and there are now four main systems in use. Uh, and, it, and it goes on to state that there is now an opportunity to commission a single hosted national system to support the new uh, permanent scheme with a single set of parameters. This would be consistent with the National Public Sector ICT strategy. Are there any plans to, to take that forward? 
The Improvement Service have, have been examining that issue on behalf of the Local Government ICT Board, and they've, I think they've just recently completed the first phase of that, that work. They concluded that a single IT system is probably unworkable due to setup costs and integration issues across local authorities. They moved on to a second phase now, which is considering how how procurement could be taken forward and, and the requirements that local authorities have for integration issues and, and the way they can work across within their local authorities. And part of that would potentially include taking forward procurement arrangements for each of the, the four main providers. But that's an ongoing piece of work. We could we could keep you updated with that appreciate as, that. as that comes forward. It, it was just to add that the four IT suppliers that we're talking about are the four IT suppliers that provide a, a range of services to local authorities. So these are um, IT suppliers that are already providing services to the um, local authorities. So going with the same IT supplier gives the, the, the individual local authority the ability to embed the new system within other services within its council. It's not four new IT suppliers that are completely unknown to the local authorities. So there are certain advantages into um, you know, you know, buying in a new module from, from an IT supplier that they're already working with. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm going to open out the session now, and the first person to ask questions will be Jamie, to be followed by Michael. Thank you, uh, Camille. Obviously, uh, as a member of the Welfare Reform Committee as well, I'll be able to follow up uh, some of this, but in relation to the financial memorandum and the uh, area that the, the Committee has touched on a little, the second tier review uh, issue, obviously the local authorities have express some uh, concern about uh, the Ombudsman taking on this role. We heard a little bit of that uh, at the Welfare Reform Committee uh, yesterday, but I wonder if there is uh, an issue here uh, with uh, an individual local authority, particularly uh, Scotland's smaller local authorities. Uh, they would be handling such a small uh, number of uh, second tier reviews that if it remained with them, would there be an issue with them having such a small caseload that they wouldn't be able to maintain the expertise to, to deal with this? I think that's that's part of the issue, and, and being able to bring in independent members for second tier review panels as well was potentially a, a difficulty for for local authorities. So yeah, I think that's that's a fair point. If if the numbers did stay did stay so low, then then yeah, maintaining that that expertise and and the getting into the mindset, I suppose, of the of the decision making that's required under the scheme could be difficult. I mean, even with your assumption, I want to turn to the assumption of 2,000 reviews per year, it could even still be an issue for some of the, the smaller authorities, I, I would have thought. But turning to that uh, figure, you know, why have you arrived at the, the assumption that there will be 2,000 uh, reviews per year? That's a very good question. We had That's why I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> and the short answer is, you know, we, we had a lot of discussion with COSLA, with local authorities, with the um, independent review service that used to provide the same kind of type of service under the old DWP scheme. Um, and it's not quite finger in the air, but you know, it was it was it seemed a reasonable number. I mean, the, the numbers for this year have been very very low. Um, I think we had 120 um, second tier reviews for community care grants uh, and only 24 for crisis grants, which was very low, probably lower than we expected. Um, the informal kind of feedback that we've had from local authorities this year is that already we, we expect that that number will, will broadly have doubled by the, the end of the of the second year of the scheme. So you know we we took a view that that you know six thousand seemed far too high in in relation to the experience of, of, of what was happening in Scotland now, um, and we arrived at a figure kind of kind of somewhere in the middle at, at, at two thousand in consultation with stakeholders. Okay, well, I recognise it is obviously difficult given this is sort of uncharted territory. It's all pretty new for the, the government and also local authorities, so I, I, I get that. Well, nonetheless, you have got a lower end estimate of 400 uh, reviews, and I think the conveners made the point that at that level, with the, the uh, funding that would be involved uh, per case, you'd actually be spending more to administer the case than the award itself would have been, which seems uh, rather uh, Cost and effective, I think you'd be virtually at this position. I'm not advocating this for obvious reasons. You'd be at this position where you'd be just better paying the person the money to be more cost effective. I'm not advocating that for obvious uh, reasons, or at least I hope they're obvious uh, reasons. But uh, you did uh, say, out, Mr. Webster, that um, this was the most cost effective option going to the uh, ombudsman. And I wonder if you could just give us a bit more 
uh, information, you know, what were the other options and what were the costs involved uh, there? The consultation that we sent out last November on the draft bill included a, a specific section on, on reviews because that was that was one of the the advantages of moving to the bill is that we could have an independent um, second tier review panel. It covered or suggested the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman as one option, a tribunal as another and a local government panel with independent representation within that and we worked with COSLA to, to work up cost estimates for local government panels. We had, we had discussions with the tribunal service and the ombudsman around set up costs and asked, estimated the annual costs of that as well, which which we included in our um, in our BRIA that supported the bill. And the estimated cost per case based on 2,000 cases a year for the ombudsman comes out at £202. The tribunal was 413 and a local government panel was somewhere between 420 and 520 pounds per case on that. So the other options were significantly in excess of, of the ombudsman then? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, convener. Um, in speaking to local authorities, it's been pointed out that the administrative cost of the, the new uh, fund is, is an ad addition to what they did before. I mean, this is something that the local authorities did. This is not the upgrading or the stepping up of something that was already in place. This is something that's entirely new. So the costs are new costs. And if the funding for the administration uh, falls short, then the local authorities have to find the additional costs from within existing budgets. Now, the evidence that we've taken at the Welfare Reform Committee so far shows that what has happened is that staff who are doing jobs in welfare departments, benefits departments of local authorities have been transferred across to take care of the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. That means that those jobs are not being done any longer um, that were being done. So somewhere along the line here, uh, local authorities are being burdened one way or another. Either they're finding the staff to, to administer the Scottish Welfare Fund from existing staff, or they're trying to run the Scottish Welfare Funds without the, the required amount of staff to do it. Have you any indication at all of these additional costs, and have they been factored into the considerations? We've <coughs> obviously been aware of the concerns that local authorities have, have raised with the, the committee on admin funding and they recognise that it is new costs. We provided set up costs to local authorities of around two million pounds when to, to help them get themselves ready for for the the start of the the funds and the the admin funding that we provide them is roughly fifteen percent of the of the the programme funding for the scheme which we think is fairly generous amount for administering a scheme of this type. 10% is the sort of typical amount that we would use in procuring um, administration systems throughout the Scottish Government. And that that ranges from loan schemes that might be 78% at the lower end up to 15% for complex projects that require quite a lot of, of reporting. So, so we think that the, the admin funding is fairly generous on that basis, we, we realise that local authorities are, are obviously making a case that, that it's not sufficient to, for them to deliver the scheme and there's been correspondence between Councillor O'Neill and the Deputy First Minister on the admin funding and I, I think this maybe came up yesterday at the Welfare Reform Committee that COSLA are undertaking a benchmarking exercise at the moment to look at what the, the true costs are and, and where, where some local authorities are are performing delivering within their admin funding, what might others learn from that and, and what where are there areas where the costs aren't being captured maybe quite as they should be. And DFM's said that she'd be willing to consider the evidence that comes from that benchmarking to to look at future admin funding going forward. Okay, that, that, that's really helpful. In terms of you know, we've heard the, the convener and, and uh, Jamie Hepburn commenting on the, the costs 
uh, of the SPSO doing the, the, the second tier um, um, assessments in comparison to a local authority doing it and in comparison to the amount that's been uh, awarded. Now, that has been interrogated, but what hasn't been made clear is whether, and we've heard evidence to this effect, um, is that the burden that would be placed on the SPSO, regardless of whether you think the figures are, are right or not, appears to have been underestimated in exactly the same way as it has been in the arguments of the local authorities. That the burden that's going to be placed on the SPSO um, is going to require their staff, either more staff to be recruited to take care of this or for staff to be transferred from current uh, responsibilities to these additional responsibilities. And again, the evidence that we've heard so far is that people think there's been an underestimate of what that cost is going to be. Um, would you like to comment on that? We've been in discussions with SPSO for for quite some time, and as I mentioned, we were we were discussing this with the tribunal service as well as the consultation was going on in the bill. They've they've been in discussions with their counterparts in Northern Ireland who administer a, a similar um, process over there, and that's where the cost estimates have really stemmed from for the, the delivery of this. So they, they've been looking at an existing service. And while there would, there would be differences, obviously, here as it was implemented, I think it's a it's a reasonable basis for for assumptions to be made on or estimates to be made of, of how much it would cost them in their, in their running costs for that. So you don't believe that there has been an underestimate overall of the, the burden this is going to place on the SPSO? I don't think so. I think we've we've been engaging with them for for quite some time. We've got we've got a, a range of of um, potential numbers of cases that, that they've considered and factored into the the running costs. I think it's it's too early to tell what what level of reviews we will end up with. But I think on the current figures, two thousand is probably quite a, a good estimate, and that's what they based a lot of their thinking on. We'll obviously have to interrogate that elsewhere. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, John, to be followed by Gavin. Uh, thanks, convener. I mean, I have to say, on reading these papers, my initial reaction was, how on earth can we be spending £5 million in order to hand out £33 million? I mean, that is 15%, as I think you've said. Now, the public sector generally gets criticised for being bureaucratic and inefficient and all these kind of things, and I just feel figures like this absolutely underline that that you know, surely somebody can hand out £33 million without it costing £5 million. Is that it? Could you clarify then what's involved in the administration and especially the second tier reviews? I think initially you've obviously got your, your sort of first level of call handling and, and taking applications is, is the, the sort of simplest element up front, I guess, of the administration. And beyond that, and I think areas where local authorities are finding they are incurring quite significant costs is taking forward the, the award. And in, in cases where local authorities are, are providing goods, for instance, there's, there's issues around receipting that and arranging deliveries and making sure that, that these things are followed up and they're happening as, as they should be, and then reconciling all of that at the end of the process. So that's, that's adding on some cost to local authorities. There, the other element where local authorities are suggesting to us that they're, they're using time and resource is trying to fulfil the sort of holistic nature of, of the welfare fund and passing applicants on to other areas of the local authority that might be able to help them or signposting them to third sector services that might exist in, in the local authority area. So I think that's, that's hopefully a sort of a reasonable summary of where the admin costs are. I mean, part of me just wonders if we're not going about this the wrong way. That I mean, it, it just seems like you know we're saying, well, that's a good cost and that's a good cost and a bit of advice and a bit of this and a bit of that, and it just all builds up and builds up and builds up, rather than saying, a eh, well, let's say you know, let's it's a hundred, if if six hundred pounds is the or thereabouts is the amount to be given, you know, the other way of looking at it would be say, right, well, fifty pounds would be a reasonable amount for admin. Do what you can for fifty pounds, and and that's it. 
I mean, would that not be another way of looking at it? I guess that is another way that you, you could approach it. I, I think the idea behind the fund is, is to try and focus as much as we can on, on the applicants and trying to, to help them to move on from whatever crisis they might be in. A crisis grant in itself won't necessarily do that. It will meet their immediate need. But if you can, if you can have that extra function within the welfare fund that, that signposts them or, or refers them to another service that helps them to, to manage their lives more effectively and, and avoid crisis again in the future, then that's, that's one of the, the functions that we hope the fund will... Well, I mean, I realise I'm, I'm the Welfare Committee and I'm sure have looked at this and or whoever's been looking at the thing, but I'm like, coming at it afresh, I just find it, you know, still really quite strange. I mean, we've got Citizens Advice Bureau, we've got loads of organisations out there that are meant to be people pointing people, and I'm sure it's the same people, towards where they can get help and assistance and advice and all of these kind of things. And I mean, the way I'm looking at it is that five million for administration is five million less for, that could actually be helping people who are having a crisis. And we seem to have the evidence from Glasgow they're only helping the, the, the most desperate uh, people. And any pound we could get out of that five million would be a pound that would be going to actually help real people in real struggles. So, I mean, I accept that's not your decision, but uh, I'm just indicating what my reaction to it is. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you for that, John Gavin. Thanks. I mean, just uh, I was interested in, in Mr Mason's remarks. I mean, I just wonder, following on from that, would it be correct to say then that the five million pounds, while it's classed as administration funding in the financial memorandum here, from the from the description that you just gave, some of that money at least isn't really being spent on processing forms, as it were. It's there's, there's an advice function as well. Is that did I hear that correctly? It's not. I wouldn't necessarily class it as an advice function. It's more. It's more referring or signposting people to other sources of advice that might be able to, to help them with any other issues they might have when they're presenting to the, to the fund would be the way I would see it, rather than offering advice at that point on, on the issues that they, the claimants might have or the applicants might have. Okay. All right. Um, I want to come to the, the memorandum itself. Can, can I refer you to paragraph 19? of the financial memorandum, and more specifically just the table sitting under, just underneath that. Um, just a couple of questions about that. Um, the first column with actual numbers on it, uh, the first column at the left, is described as programme funding, and for each of three financial years, uh, the programme funding is down as £33 million. Um, if I heard your answers to the convener correctly, for 13-14, the actual outturn uh, was approximately £29 million. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. And if I heard you correctly then, does that then mean that the programme funding for fourteen fifteen then becomes £37 million? Yes, yeah, so that money was carried forward within the local authorities to, to be spent on the welfare fund. Okay, so, so the, the, the entirety of the underspend for thirteen fourteen goes into... 1415. Yes, right? that's yeah. it. Okay, thank you. Um, second data then, if you go to the next column, which is administration funding, uh, for the first two years it's 5 million. For 1516, it's down as TBC. Now, for some reason, I thought I read in there somewhere that it was probably going to be 5 million, but I now can't find that reference. Um, is, is TBC effectively going to be 5 million or in that? in that ballpark or is it are you unable to say at this stage? I I can't say that ex well exactly will sure. be five million we still have to go through the, the budget processes. I I understand there's there's funding available to to meet that sort of level but the actual the actual amount will remain to be seen and I think that will possibly be influenced by the benchmarking work that COSL are undertaking at okay. the moment. Um, so you can't give an exact answer. Fair, fair enough. It, would it be fair to say, to say that it will not be significantly higher or lower than £5 million? 
I don't want to put words in your mouth, so don't don't um, just say no if, if you can't. So I'm just trying to get a feel for what the what the financial memorandum is, is most likely to be. Yeah, I I can't say obviously what what it would end up as being. I can't I can't imagine it would vary significantly either way. But obviously that's yeah, okay. subject to discussions between um, Scottish ministers and COSLA around admin funding for next year and the outcome of the benchmarking work. Okay, no, I think I think that answer is fair enough. Um, uh, just the last last one, then, convener. The, the next come along is second tier review funding. You've clearly had a number of uh, questions in relation to that. Um, just one question, though. Obviously, you, you, you're going on not many years' figures. So you're trying to, to work out, you know, what you, what you think the, the most accurate figures are likely to be, and you put those uh, two figures down for each of the two financial years. Um, but the question is simply: give, given that this financial memorandum was produced or published on the 10th of June. And the work leading up to it, you know, that you would have done your homework presumably in the weeks and months leading up to that. Has anything happened in the, you know, I guess almost four months since then that changes any of these figures at all uh, for second tier review funding, or does that still remain your uh, your best estimate uh, for for fourteen fifteen, and indeed for fifteen sixteen? Yeah, I think that the figures still remain. I think, as you say, the best estimate for for that we. We have some understanding of of an increase in second tier reviews in the, the early part of this financial year, which suggests that the unit within SPSO will be viable. There will be, there'll be enough numbers of reviews to make that um, viable for them to to run that that unit. But beyond that, there's there's nothing to change sure. the figures that we've got in the memorandum. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's all, Convener. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Gavin. Malcolm. There's quite a lot of talk about linking with other services. Is that, is that really partly to ensure that no case that meets the relevant criteria slips through the system, or is it really just to make sure that additional help is given to, for the people that apply? I think it's to make sure that, that the people who apply get the help that, that's available and they can get. And I think that's potentially the way the scheme works is potentially why we're seeing fewer reviews than we might have seen under the previous DWP scheme. Because if an applicant's refused here, then they, the hope is that they'd be referred or signpost to another service, either within the local authority or within the local area, that would that be able to help them. They're not just getting a, a, a sort of flat refusal. So hopefully it, the, the applicants are, are getting a better, or they're having a better experience and a better outcome from, from the scheme. I mean, that, that's interesting about the reviews being down. I mean, I wonder, I mean, there's a lot of interest, obviously, in the ombudsman. There's not that big a variation in terms of the administrative costs for a high number of appeals or a low number. But has any thought been given to whether the nature of the decisions from the ombudsman may well be different from the nature of the decisions from the local authority? Presumably, they'll be administrating, administering national criteria across Scotland. Whereas presumably when local authorities have been reviewing, they've been doing it very much within the context of the money that's available to that particular local authority and the demand that they're facing. I mean, I think you, you yourself said earlier on that sometimes money might just not be available because of high demand or the time of the year, whereas presumably the appeal system will not consider such factors at all if it's done on a national basis by the ombudsman. I think the intention is that the ombudsman would take into account the local conditions and the 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 priority level that the local authority was operating under when they were considering a review application. So they they wouldn't just be looking at at the case from a sort of central point. They would be they would be taking into account the the conditions that were in place in the local authority at that. So you don't envisage the nature of the decisions being fundamentally different from what they would be under a local authority system? No, I don't think so. No. 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 Okay. And in, I mean, I think you've said that the money can be carried over from year to year. I mean, I'm just wondering what happens if a lot of, a lot of appeals are granted and, and there just isn't money available in that year's budget? I mean, is the assumption you would just have to dip into the following year's budget or how would that work? 
I think the assumption would be that the local authority would have to dip into the following year's budget, but hopefully that will be a very, very small number of cases. And as Callum said, you know, the Ombudsman will be expected to take account um, the state of the budget in that particular local authority when, when they are um, remaking the case. OK, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for that. That has concluded the questions from colleagues uh, around the table. But I just want to touch on one thing because it hasn't been raised so far in the questioning, and it's the submission from the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, which has put in a fairly interesting submission, different from any of the others that we've received. And they say, in a quote, we're concerned about the relative speed at which the bill is being taken forward. They're actually suggesting that the bill be uh, delayed to review options. And what they've said uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, a section which they call rationale for the legislation. They say, and I quote, before the bill begins to undergo parliamentary scrutiny, we need to be clear about the rationale and necessity of the legislation. And they ask, is there a threat to the con continuity of the fund? Will the legislation help applicants to be better protected? And is legislation absolutely necessary? I think we, we've approached the introduction of the bill um, and looking at sort of three-fold benefits that would come from it, potential applicants would have the, the certainty that the welfare funds would continue, because at the moment they're only delivered on a voluntary agreement between COSLA and Scottish ministers. The other elements are that we could allow for independent review by SPSO, which wouldn't be possible under the current arrangements. And the third option is to allow the option for the funding to be ring-fenced for, for the welfare funds going forward as well. So there's, we think there are sort of definable benefits to, to be had by, by bringing the bill in at the moment. And a lot of submissions that, that I've seen that have been sent, particularly to the Welfare Reform Committee, they've looked at, I suppose, operational issues and, and things that that are affecting this, the day-to-day -day running of, of the scheme, which don't necessarily impact on the bill, but they will have much more an impact on the regulations and the guidance that will that'll sit underneath that. And that's that's something that we'll continue to take on board learning from as as we go through the the process of introducing the legislation now. And hopefully we can reflect that learning in the in the regulations and the guidance when they come into to effect after after the Act's passed. Okay, thank you. Michael wanted to come in on this point. That's a, a, a very small question. It's, it's more a statement, but I'll ask it as a question just to see if you agree with me. Another point that was made yesterday by uh, witnesses to the, the Welfare Reform Committee as a, a justification for having the, the Scottish Welfare Fund enshrined in legislation mm. was that with the certainty of, of the, the Welfare Fund existing, it will allow local authorities to retain staff and build up expertise uh, in, in the delivery of, of the fund uh, as, as they move forward. And do you see that as a valid reason for um, justifying the, the legislative pro uh, process for this? I guess if local authorities see that as being a, a big advantage from it, I'd, I guess I'm not well enough versed with their HR procedures and processes and, and how they recruit and retain staff really to, to comment on it. It certainly convinced me. <laughs> oh, well, that's something then. <laughs> uh, there was an issue there about uh, about uh, training, actually, which was raised as well. I mean, uh, there have been concerns raised in terms of some of the submissions with regard to the amount available for training of staff. Uh, what's, the, what, what's the kind of um, uh, level of funding that's going to be available uh, as we move forward? Because obviously you do have turnover in staff in any organisation. Uh, and is that something you expect to be self-funding from uh, lo by local authorities as we? Uh, as we I, I guess dealing with issues of turnover would would be something local authorities would have to deal with themselves. But certainly, since even before the fund was established, we've put. I think I mentioned the two million set up funding. Some of that was used for to provide training materials and and courses. Um, for would-be decision makers before the fund had even started, we we've, we've run some seminars as well over the course of the the last eighteen months that the fund's been running to look at specific issues of decision making and and prioritisation these types of things, and we'll continue to fund our quality um, improvement officer who tries to sort of take a view across 
cases and, and spread good practice and, and help people to develop their understanding and their abilities to, to take decisions there. So we, we're doing things across the piece to try and try and support and, and help people develop their, their skills within the fund. But I think for individuals sort of turnover within local authorities, that would be down to them to, to manage that. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Are there any further points you want to make now that we've concluded our questions? Anything else that we haven't covered that you want to say to the committee? No, thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much for answering all our questions and thanks to colleagues for their questions. Uh, that being the last item on the agenda, that concludes the Finance Committee for today.